So this lecture is what is a niche? Now, there's a lot of different definitions of a niche. And the, and the original definition can go all the way back to Joseph Grinnell. Back around 1917, when he was studying the California Thrasher, and he realized that Thrashers were confined to chaparral habitat, and he defined their niche as where they lived and what they were doing within that habitat. Then by the 1920s, Elton also came up with an idea of a niche, but the one that I'm going to follow most closely today is, of course, the Hutchinsonian niche by none other than Evelyn Hutchinson himself. Now, Hutchinson was an amazing scientist, ecologist, and limnologist as well. And he posed a very simple question in the 1950s. And that question was, why are there so many species? I mean, we have, what, over 2 million described species? There's probably 10 million? Well, from there, he went on to develop what we call the Hutchinsonian niche. Now, this gets a little complicated, but he calls it an n-dimensional hypervolume where species can exist. I, I know, n-dimensional hypervolume. Well, okay, so n means we've, we have multiple dimensions, and a hypervolume means it's a big space in multiple dimensions. So it's a hypervolume because it's more than just three dimensions, you know, like length, width, and height. But these dimensions are the environmental conditions and resources needed for a population to persist. And the hypervolume, like I said, that's the multidimensional resources, light, nutrients, water, structure, and also all the interactions that species are having with each other. So that is basically a niche. Now, now we can also think of a niche as basically where you find an animal or a plant or any species and what it's doing there. That's a very simplistic way of thinking of a niche. And Hutchinson, he was pretty amazing. I mean, the guy not only pushed ecology forward, he also was a great limnologist, and he didn't have a PhD and taught at Yale. He was one of the last scientists to do that. And uh, one of his students was none other than Robert MacArthur of Island Biogeography fame. So he trained some amazing scientists and really did a lot of good for ecology and bringing us uh, forward into the modern world. Now, one thing about this niche, this n-dimensional hypervolume of all these different resources and biotic interactions, we can partition the niche further into what is called a fundamental niche. This is where you can find a species based on its physiology and free from species interactions. So this map on the right, you notice shaded in green is much of the southeast. That is the distribution of where you can find cypress trees. Now, out here in the west, not many people are familiar with wetlands and streams and swamps and lakes, but that is where you typically find a cypress tree. If you go to the southeast, you're not going to randomly find a cypress tree. You're going to find one growing along the edge of a beautiful swamp, stream, or river. So, here's the point. A cypress tree can grow throughout the southeast based on physiological tolerances, but that's not where we find them. We find them within that fundamental niche confined to these wetlands. And that is called the realized niche. This is a more narrow range of the fundamental niche, and this is actually limited by biotic interactions. How are species interacting with each other? So we find cypress trees in wetlands. Why don't we find them outside of wetlands? And, and that would limit their realized niche. And then outside of their fundamental niche, they're probably limited by water availability. They don't grow out here in the West. It's too dry for them. And they don't grow farther north because it's too cold for them. But there's a lot more to this story. So let's take a closer look. But before I dive into the niches, you know, there's something we need to talk about in ecology. We need to talk about the importance of natural history. And for me, I've, I've done ecology and I've done natural history. And uh, I do a lot more natural history these days than I do actual ecology. I know, I'm, I have a PhD in ecology. So let's talk about this. What's the difference here? And in fact, my entire PhD occurred 
because I was doing natural history. I was taking photographs. So natural history, it relies on a curious mind that starts making observations. Right? Science starts with people making observations and asking questions. Now natural history is more observational based. It's where do you find organisms? What are they doing? Now, not everybody agrees on the definition of natural history, but for example, let's say you you go to the coast of California and you want to start learning the names of all the different types of species you might find growing on the rocks. And you might realize, well, there's at least two different species of barnacles. There's a larger balanus, you typically find it lower on the rocks, and then there's the smaller, I have no idea how to pronounce this, Cithalamus, Cithamalus, Cithamalus. Uh, I have no idea how to pronounce that, Cithamalus. Somebody can correct me. And these are smaller barnacles growing higher up on the rocks. And you might also find mussels, starfish, cnidarians, which are the sea anemones, little hermit crabs, and different types of algae growing along these rocky intertidal coasts, along with some different fish. So my natural history knowledge is gonna let me know, hey, if I wanna find balanus, I've gotta look lower down on the rocks. So this natural history, it starts letting me observe patterns in nature. Where do I find them? What time of year might I find something, right? And we can understand kind of what they're doing there as well. But remember, this is mostly observational, this natural history knowledge. By doing natural history, we started to see that the distribution of these barnacles is different on these rocks. Okay, so that's important. Now, natural history is more than just going to a rocky intertidal coast in California. I'm also a birder, herper. I like fish, I like arthropods, I like flowers, I like snails, I like it all. But natural history, like, I'm a birder. I love to go out and go birding. And one of my favorite birds are American dippers. And now the American Dipper is found throughout the entire Western United States, but I don't find them at my home out here in outside of um, Albuquerque, not at all. There's no mountain streams out here. So I know that if I wanna go find an American Dipper, well, one place I'm gonna go is the Jemez Mountains. I'm gonna go to the East Fork of the Jemez because I usually see them there. Why? These are the only swimming songbird in North America. I know they swim in frigid water too but they dive under the water and they catch aquatic insects. They're a specialist for this. So even though they have this very large range throughout the West, you have to go to mountain streams to find the American Dipper and that's natural history. And as a birder, I know where to find lots of different types of birds based on time of year and habitat. Now, natural history is like the basic foundations of ecology in terms of science begins making observations, right? We acquire this knowledge, this observational knowledge, but there are limitations to natural history. One of that is there are observations. So we might know where a species is found. We might not know exactly why. Sometimes we do, but maybe not. And with the case of these barnacles, we may not know what's limiting or causing their distribution along those rocks. This is where we need ecology. Now ecology, ecos means house, ology means study of. So ecology, study of this house. The house of course being our natural environment. This is the study of the interactions between organisms themselves and their environment. And ecology is informed by natural history where we make our observations, we ask questions, and you know what comes next? We do experiments. So ecology is much more experimentally driven than the observational natural history. And these two fields are intricately linked to each other. So if I want to understand the community structure of this barnacles growing on a rock, and I mean it's structured, the reason why I call it structured is because the two species aren't randomly distributed around the rock. One is higher, one is lower. That is structure. So to understand the driver of that community structure, we need an experiment. And that's exactly what happens. So now I want to show the importance of an experiment. You know, Joseph Connell, back in the 1950s, right about the time of Hutchinson, you know, giving his 
and dimensional hyper volume definition of our niche, Connell did a simple removal experiment. He just removed the smaller thalamus and the larger balanus on different rocks and, and looked around to see what happened next. So he followed this for several years. Now here's the results. When Connell removed the larger balanus species from lower on the rocks, the smaller thalamus grew down into the rocks. Okay. Now, on the flip side, when the smaller thalamus were removed higher up on the rocks, balanus didn't respond. It didn't change where it was growing. They always remained at a certain level along the water line. Ah, now we know we have two factors that are causing the structure of this community. What are they? Well, and these are related to our niches, our fundamental niche and our realized niche. So first, balanus is limited by its physiological tolerances. It can't grow higher up on the rock because, well, it's larger, but it can't hold water as well. It needs more food. It can't resist the drying out. So it's limited by physiological tolerances. So in this case, balanus's distribution was based on its fundamental niche and its physiological tolerances. Now, the realized niche, thalamus. When you remove the larger barnacle, thalamus grew down the rocks. It was being outcompeted by the larger balanus. So its fundamental niche was actually much larger because it could grow way down the rocks, but it had a smaller realized niche due to a biotic interaction. And this biotic interaction was it got outcompeted by the larger balanus. It couldn't grow down there. It just got outcompeted. Okay, so there we go. Now we know that there were at least two factors determining the distribution of the community. And we wouldn't have known that without doing an experiment. So now you get to see the importance of species interactions determining the realized niche, right? So in this case, competition was driving that community structure. There are other types of species interactions that I'll talk about next. We can also go back to our cypress tree example that I began with. Cypress trees can be found, can be found, can be found throughout the Southeast, but we only find them in wetlands. And you might be thinking, well, they need really wet soils to grow. Well, actually, years ago, when I was about 11 years old in 1985, I planted a cypress tree in our yard. We were nowhere near a wetland. And my dad, he goes, son, you're going to have to pour water to that tree. Well, you know, being 11, I, I watered it and it grew. Then years later, I stopped watering it. That tree is, you know, this big around and 50 feet high today, and it is nowhere near water. And it made me realize, ah, it's confined to wetlands, and it can grow in upland areas just fine, except it would get quickly outcompeted by much faster growing and pine trees. So once again, the fundamental niche of a cypress tree is much larger than its realized niche. It's reduced once again by competition. I know another example of competition, but here we go. The American Dipper, found throughout the entire American West. However, its realized niche is much smaller because part of its n-dimensional hypervolume is it needs clear, fast-moving, rocky streams so they can forage for small aquatic insects, specifically the larvae of aquatic insects like caddisflies, mayflies, and stoneflies. So in this case, its realized niche is based on interactions in terms of predation. Who is it eating? Because it can't forage in the air for other insects. It can't glean insects off of trees but it is the only swimming songbird that will swim down into a stream and glean or pick off aquatic insects. Pretty cool, or specifically the larvae of those aquatic insects. So there are a couple of important points about, the spe about a species niche. One is each species occupies a unique niche. And in fact, no two species can occupy exactly the same niche at the same time because they would compete with each other. And as we'll see, that's a form of biotic interaction. And that actually drives evolution and character displacement so that the two species become more and more different 
to reduce competition. And next, there are always trade-offs. Always trade-offs, right? In this case, the thalamus barnacle evolves so that it can resist drying out. It's smaller. It doesn't need as much water to forage. It doesn't have as large of a body. And so therefore, the trade-off is it can live higher up on the rock. But it can't grow down lower because it's outcompeted by the larger balanus. The larger balanus, well, it's larger. And it can grow larger and it can outcompete these other smaller upstart barnacles, right? But as a result, it's physiologically constrained to living lower on the rocks where it has more water, less drying, and more foraging time. Another trade-off is with the cypress trees. They can grow in very wet, swampy environments where other upland trees, like pine trees and oak trees, cannot grow. The trade-off is, well, they have these physiological adaptations to a, mud, to a wet environment but that prevents them from growing faster. And then, of course, the American Dipper. Hey, it's like the only bird that forages in a stream like it does, so it doesn't have much competition, but it couldn't forage along the edge of the stream or it couldn't forage in the bushes or along the trees very well, especially compared to like the more smaller warblers and other insect eating birds. So there are no perfectly adapted species. There are always trade-offs and those trade-offs are adaptations that allow species to exist in their n-dimensional hyper volume. Okay, now stay tuned because we're gonna talk a lot more about those species interactions that determine the realized niche because, it, because it's a lot more than just competition. I know, we've been saying competition for years in ecology and it's important, but there's other ones that might be just as important as well, like uh, cooperation. All right, until next time.